Okay, well, good morning. Um, I'm not entirely sure how I find myself doing this morning, except that I made a comment and didn't duck quickly enough afterwards. So this morning's session grew out of a very short exchange that happened on the CCA WhatsApp chat, I think a couple of months ago now, about the disconnect within churches who profess to love the young people with whom they work, and then to quote the writer of the original comment, burn the ground they walk on. And as someone who has worked with children and young people for most of my working life in one form or another, I was a bit stopped in my tracks by the comment and decided to look into it a, a bit. So that's how I find myself doing this morning. Just to warn you, I am not a theologian, but at least part of my motivation as an activist is my own children, my work with other people's children, and I know that's the case for a lot of us. So I'm going to share a bit of my thinking on that disconnect and how it's become possible within the church, and we'll see where it goes. So let's start with where young people are on this. <coughs> An awful lot of young people do care about the environment and climate, the climate crisis and biodiversity loss are things that seem to come up with them in particular. And because they care, a lot of them are suffering from eco-anxiety. If you read almost any article about that, the young people themselves talk about feeling that they have to take responsibility for doing something about climate change because they've been let down by the older generations. And that's us, or most of us. And those of us who have conversations about this sort of thing with the young people have to try and find a balance between not adding to their anxiety, but being honest about what's going on. And that's really not easy, as a lot of you will know. I read um, an article in the Washington Post about eco-anxiety, and I think it transfers quite well into thinking about church. So this came from the point of view of a secondary school teacher, Park, Park Guthrie. And in, for a teacher is um, a mandated reporter, someone who's legally required to speak up about signs of child abuse and neglect. And his thinking is that if climate change will harm his students and is causing them anguish, then him staying silent on the issue is a violation of his duty. And the article goes on to say that education and youth groups don't always see climate change as having a direct link to children and young people unless they are actively being placed by some sort of climate related disaster. And sometimes they don't even see it then. And I think we have the same issue in our churches. And it's maybe exacerbated by the fact that in a lot of our churches, our focus has, in my opinion, become narrower than it should be. Narrower than what truly brings those who, of us who are part of the Christian community fullness of life. Um, I just want to say that in saying what I'm gonna say this morning, I'm not judging any particular way of doing church or any particular theological box you might think of yourself as being in. I am speaking largely from personal experience and what I see, what I think I see in the places with which I'm familiar. So my title for this morning is Saving Souls versus Saving the Planet, because I think that at a fundamental level, many Christian communities do make this a question of two different things, things that are in opposition with one another, rather than two things which belong intimately together. So Let's hit the Bible, starting at the beginning. And I know you know this story already. God made the world. He put humankind into that world as part of it with responsibility for it. Humankind made a bad choice and blew it. The world became a harsher place, but the responsibility was not taken away. So in Genesis 3, even as God is telling Adam and Eve that they must leave the garden, he says, the ground is cursed because of you. But then he goes on to say that the ground will provide them with plants to eat as well as weeds to get in the way and that they will have to work with that ground in order to survive. So the people who wrote this down 
knew just as well as we do that if you want your soil to produce good crops, you have a responsibility to look after it. And if you don't look after it, it won't look after you. So they still have a responsibility to care for the land, a responsibility to the changed version of what God has given them. And through that, a responsibility to be the people that God intended them to be, even though it has just, to be fair, got a lot harder. Something I think I see in church now is that we don't accept the responsibility that is ours as Christian community, or that maybe we've changed what we think we are responsible for. And I'll come back to that one later. So in the Bible, life goes on. Sometimes people get it right and they're close to God and living the way that brings them fullness of life. And sometimes they get it wrong and they move away from him. And it's amazing how often when God calls his people back to him, that call includes something about the land. So 2 Chronicles 7, classic bit, Solomon is dedicating the temple. There are major sacrifices of the best that the land has to offer. There's celebration, solemn assembly, and finally a dedicated temple. Then God appears to Solomon in the night. God vo voices his approval of Solomon's temple and his prayer. And then he issues a warning. And it says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locust to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, you may argue with my interpretation of this, but it seems to me that as a church now and in recent history, we are really good at looking at the bit that says when things go wrong, we need to humble ourselves, pray, seek God, turn away from sin and be forgiven. But we're also quite good at overlooking the little bit of, at the end about healing our land. The idea of covenant faithfulness and the well-being of creation and the relationship between those things is there all through Chronicles 6 and 7 and in lots of other places in scripture. And I think it should connect with us as a church much more strongly than I see it doing in general at the moment. God's promises to heal our land so clearly and obviously connect with what all of us are passionate about, but few of our churches, in my experience anyway, make any specific connection between human sin and forgiveness and the brokenness of the natural world. I think that um, if our young people had been around in Solomon's day, they and we would have seen much more clearly a culture where the faith of the people and the well-being of the land were firmly intertwined. And one of the things that I love about the Jewish way of life, both in history and now to, still to some extent, is what seems to me a totally non-dualistic way of thinking. There's no sacred secular divide. Life is just life, everything belongs. And it's also a very much a communal way of life, not just in terms of humanity, but in terms of all of creation. And so into this, Jesus comes. And then there's a question, do we still see the connection between the people and the land in the gospels? And to be honest, yes and no, it is there because it was part of the background and the foundation of the Jewish culture into which Jesus was born and into which he was speaking. But as we look at the gospel scriptures in church and with our young people, maybe that connection is harder to see unless we specifically highlight it. So brief example, Looking at Mark's account of Jesus going out into the wilderness to be tempted, it says, and the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. So you can really easily read the wilderness being a bad place to be, the wild beasts being a threat which need to be subdued. But I came across an idea in a book by Richard Balcom, so this is not my idea, 
which suggests that this scene actually depicts an ideal, that Jesus is with the wild animals and they present no threat to him because he has come to restore the whole of the created order. That's probably not the way that it gets presented in church. I've certainly never heard it presented that way until now. And so it's not an idea that filters through our teaching and into our Christian lives. We tend to read the New Testament through the individualistic lens of our culture. And we don't see the way that the early church assumed that all life was communal life. So a lot of the young people in our churches, and I know this is a generalization because lots of us are doing it brilliantly, but in a lot of places, the young people are on the end of our well-planned and enthusiastic teaching about how much God loves them, how Jesus came to restore their relationship with God, and what following him will bring to them and their lives, which is obviously true and important, but can be and often is presented as totally individualistic and person-centered. And I think one of the reasons for this is the way that we, meaning the church across the world, see hell. Now this may sound a bit odd, but stick with me and maybe you'll see what I mean, or you can shred my arguments later. But I wonder, even as I say the word hell, what picture is your mind conjuring up? So a very quick and potted history. Back in Old Testament times, the Jews didn't believe in an afterlife, but in the couple of hundred years before Jesus arrived, their thinking began to change. And they began to talk about the day when all of the dead would come back to life, be judged, and either be restored to some kind of glorious earthly living or be permanently obliterated. This thinking was still the Jewish, the dominant Jewish view in the time of Jesus. And Jesus put a different spin on it by saying that people would not come to this place of glory by following all of the Jewish laws and practices, but simply by loving God and loving other people. In the places where we read Jesus talking about, about hell, where the word often in scripture is translated as hell, the word he actually uses is Gehenna. This was not some mis mystical place with a, a lake of fire, but it was an actual place which was considered by the Jews to be the most God-forsaken place on the planet, as it was probably, possibly, the place where child sacrifice was practiced by other religions. And Jesus actually appears to be saying that rather than experiencing decent burial when you died, which was incredibly important, whichever worldview in the ancient world you were part of, <clears throat> that those who were condemned would be thrown into a desecrated dumping ground and just gone. No mention of burning forever or torture or torment. So in Matthew 7.13, it says... Uh, Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction and there are many who take it. For the road is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life and there are few that find it. That word destruction is often translated as hell, but actually the original Greek word does say destruction and that is really important because it tells us that choosing the right path leads to life and choosing the wrong path leads to destruction, not to torture forever. Then in the few first few centuries of the church, <coughs> we get Irenaeus who believed in annihilationism, that the wicked would simply fade from existence and Oregon who was a universalist and believed there would be punishment after death but only until people repented and could be restored to their original state of purity. And then in the fifth century, we get Augustine, and he's the one who kind of messed this up because he believed in the literal existence of a lake of fire where the damned would suffer for all of eternity. A very useful picture for keeping people under control in a church that has a lot of power. And that was the view that the church picked up on and hung on to for the next 1500 years or so. <coughs> and I think this bit of our history 
feeds the individualistic idea of salvation that we see across the Christian church today. So this doctrine, this underlying thought and fear is a big part, I think, of what has separated us as church from the unity of people and the rest of creation within the salvation story. Like I say, feel free to shred that argument in discussion later. But coming back to what we present to our young people, to what we feel we are responsible for presenting to them, do we tell them in very simplistic terms that being a Christian matters because it keeps you out of hell, even if we don't actually use that language, is it implicit in the way that we talk to them? Do we tell them that being a Christian is great because one day you forget to live forever with God? And through that imply that actually being a Christian is not about the here and now and being part of the, bringing the kingdom to the here and now? Or do we tell them that being a Christian matters because it brings you fullness of life in the here and now as well as eternally and that part of true fullness of life is living the connectedness with all of creation as far as we can that God always intended. We sometimes talk when someone comes to faith about being saved and if a child or a young person or anyone else I guess asks you saved from what or for what what's your answer? Maybe something we can discuss in breakout groups later. But a lot of us have been enthusing this week about the brilliant letter that James Hansen wrote to Boris Johnson about the Cumbria coal mine. If you haven't read it, go and find it because it's an awesome bit of writing. But he frames everything in terms of what is at stake for our young people. That's what he says. And in an earlier document, he wrote that the greatest threat that young people face is from their adult friends. That is a horrific thing to be saying. And I don't want the church to be part of that. But I think we have to acknowledge that very often we are part of that and we need to work from that place. So on the one hand, it seems to me that we have a separation between saving souls and saving the planet that is deeply and historically ingrained in our church culture. And on the other hand, we have people like us and things that eco like eco church that lots of people are getting on board with and that's a good thing, but that maybe we're not really joining the dots at a deep level and letting it kind of catalyze a cultural change in the way that we see and do faith. So, that is something of my exploration of the disconnect between churches who profess to love young people and then burn the ground that they walk on. But it's very much about how we've got to this place. And I guess the real issue now is what we can do to change it. I know you know this passage of scripture, but I'd really like to finish off by reading a bit from Romans 8. And this is the message version simply because I love the way that it puts it. So this is Romans 8, 18 to 23 or so. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult, the difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs, but it's not only around us, it is within us. The spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That's why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. So let's listen in the right way. And thanks for listening to me. That's me.